is the first time I'm giving this talk. It's 93 slides, which means I have like 10 seconds a slide. <laughs> Alright, let's go. Uh, my name is Leif. Uh, this is the stuff, or this is my stuff from the climbing. Um, I'm named after these things, which are uh, for the plant. Uh, my parents uh, raised me on the organic farm. Um, this is my avatar, so if you've ever seen this on the internet before, then you can interact with me. Uh, a lot of people have actually asked me about this picture. Uh, I dug up the original. Um, I'm in a kayak. This is me trying to paddle home to see if Blue of Four is out yet in 2000. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, my talk is building a large web application uh, in Blue with Lapis. So I was worried about this title. It's a little pretentious using the word large. Um, I don't really know what large is. There's always someone larger. Um, but for me, large is like getting a lot of code. And the focus is on itch.io, which is a company that I started. Um, so raise your hand if you code in Lua. Okay, I'm at the right conference. Raise your hand if you make websites. Okay, some of you. Uh, raise your hand if you would recommend someone to make a website in Lua. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, raise your hand if you would make a website in Lua if you knew how to do it. Okay, okay. Um, so, uh, the web is real, obviously, um, and so is a little web development. The point of this talk is that, um, yes, you can make websites in Lua, and you can make big websites in Lua. Um, so what the heck is itch.io, why should you care? Um, it's a website I started about four years ago. It's a marketplace for independent video games and other things. Um, I kind of chose this as like a success story for a lot of tools and frameworks I've been building over the past couple of years. Um, this is something that I started, and it's accumulated a lot. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a bunch of games, people can buy stuff, works with a uh, revenue share. Um, creators can design their own storefront pages. Uh, other than just dumping out a bunch of HTML to your browser, um, a lot of other like little things happen, like dynamic image resizing, uh, people upload big files, recommendation engines, social feeds, message boards, safely rendering user-provided markup, uh, talking to really, really slow payment provider gateways, so any blocking APIs are no good. Um, spammers and hackers are constantly trying to destroy me, and hundreds of millions of requests. Um, Alexa says we're doing kind of good, I don't know, 3,500 ranked in the United States. I actually have no idea if that's good or not, but it's been growing. Um, it's really been picking up steam. It's a pun, never mind. Uh, there's over 50,000 projects uh, uploaded as of today, so yeah, people are actually using it and it's growing a lot, so it's a website. Um, and my secret is that it runs on a $20 VPS. Uh, thanks, Oko Rusty. Um, so yeah, how did we get here? I wanted to kind of rewind a little bit. Um, I got into Lua like everyone else because I know you can make games with it. I'm just kidding. Wait, wait, seriously though, raise your hand if you got into Lua because of games. Okay, okay. Um, anyway, yeah, I want to make games and some guy on IRC told me C++ is cool, but uh, you should really be scripting in Lua. Um, and he tried to teach me code routines, but I think he was drunk, so whatever. I just want to make websites. Um, <laughs> I thought, so maybe I can use Lua for that. Um, and I found this thing called Orbit. Have you ever used Orbit or heard of it? Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a web framework um, in Lua. Uh, I don't think it's maintained anymore. Um, it was a cool project. I liked it. I tried it. It didn't really click for me. And I didn't really have like a, 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 a driving project to like keep me looking into it. Um, anyway, I went back to college and experimented with a lot of things like JavaScript. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's kind of like Lua, but it's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> And everyone who enjoys it has stop point syndrome. Uh, so I took around Smart and I found something called CoffeeScript. Uh, this is pretty cool. It has like a Python style syntax for JavaScript, except there's no uh, colons. Um, it was still JavaScript though. So I thought, well, I can do this. LPEG's pretty cool, um, as you've seen from the previous presentations. Uh, so let's take out that coffee, throw in a moon, I make something a little more Lua flavored, and uh, this is our new logo. I'm no, just kidding. Uh, so I made Lua scripts. Uh, it's a transpiled language. It compiles to Lua, meaning that it runs in the Lua runtime. What this means is that you can run Lua code from Moon script, and you can run Moon script code from Lua, vice versa. Uh, it's just a different style of writing Lua. It's not like a separate thing. Um, so yeah, it's just a different style. Um, so yeah, if you thought people were upset about uh, one index to raise in Lua, just imagine the fanfare I got when I used the backslash as an operator. <laughs> Sorry, anyone who uses a Zerti. Uh, seriously, that one script isn't that bad. Let me teach you. Uh, what might this compile into? You can say stuff out loud if you want. Local X. Yeah, you got it. Local X. Uh, what might this compile into? Yeah, it defines the function and calls it. Uh, uh, what 
what might this do? It prints out all the languages that support the continue keyword. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here, here's the implementation if you care. Uh, I won't I won't delete all that. Uh, one more. What about this? Yeah, who knows? But now we're talking. <laughs> uh, in case you're curious, I wrote a pretty big guide about like why it generates all those lines of code and they're all very specific. Uh, in any case, like any self-respecting programmer who finished the project, I posted to Hacker News, and people responded. Uh, <laughs> this was a good point. What, what was I doing with my life? Uh, in any case, yeah, I needed a way to prove that it was useful, and I realized that I needed to be the evangelist of my own language, so I went back and made a bunch of games. Um, it was cool. I made a bunch of goofy stuff, but I didn't want to stop there, and that's when I realized it's time to make a web framework. Uh, Open RESTD came out around this time, this is maybe like three or four years ago, or it was starting to like get attention at this time, and I was like, this is pretty cool. Um, and so I made Lattice. Uh, yeah, the project started in 2012, uh, the first version came out in April of 2013, now it's been actively developed over the past four years, which is a pretty long time, I never really calculated. Um, so yeah, what is it? Uh, it's, it's a web framework that kind of has a, a dual interface, one that takes advantage of moonstruct sort of classes, one that also uses like a comfortable with that API, so even if you hate Moonstrip and think it's stupid, you can still use Lattice, it's fine. Um, and for this talk, I'll use Lou for all the examples, except when necessary to highlight some Moonstrip integration. Uh, these are two really basic applications, don't bother reading them, just give me a taste of it. Um, yeah, so it has good documentation. There's the website. Uh, yeah, what's the job of a web framework? Well, it sits between your business logic and your web server. Uh, your web server is a low-level interface for the requests that are happening, um, and your business logic is like what you want to do, it's the product you're building. Um, so yeah, the job of the framework is to make all the glue for in between. Um, and so it does a lot of stuff. And, uh, I professionally developed websites for a long time. Um, this is through a lot of knowledge and learning, and yeah, it does all these things. You can learn around the documentation. I'm not going to go through them. Um, I'm going to focus on some more interesting things. Uh, and yeah, one last thing it does is organization. Uh, and this is kind of how I pull back this idea of big web applications. Because once you start writing a lot of code, uh, things happen. So HIO, like as of today, is probably about 130,000 lines of Moonstrip, which compiles to about 200 something lines of Lua. Uh, that's pretty large. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that happens. Um, so yeah, how do we make sure we don't go insane when we build things like this size? Um, so what are words you think of when you hear Ruby on Rails? Probably big, slow, flooded. Um, <laughs> I was a professional Ruby on Rails developer. Uh, I respected it for how it had a very opinionated organization, but I think that it could be unfriendly or overwhelming. Um, Express is a pretty popular uh, JavaScript framework for doing routing and other things like that. It's very towards API for writing web applications, but I'm unsure about what you do when you start to get uh, hundreds of thousands of lines of code, so yeah. Um, so, um, the growth pains of itch.io essentially became the roadmap for Lattice. Um, I loved developing the framework alongside a real project because it gave me real goals to solve. This wasn't like some pet project that I would push out in a release and hope someone would use it and figure it out. Uh, because of dog food in the framework, uh, I actually feel the pain. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, let's just kind of talk about Lattice. So when you start a new project, this is what you get. Uh, some frameworks will generate like hundreds of files when you type new. This generates a couple. Uh, there's some Nginx junk you don't really care about, and then there's app up with it. Um, the interface is pretty simple. Uh, we require it. We create an application, which is the thing that serves requests. We bring in anything we might need. And then we call these things like, hey, get slash, which says matching a request to slash, and return this to the user. Or here we say, here's a route named user profile that matches this pattern. And we do some stuff, and we say render true, which happens to render a template of the same name as the route user profile. So yeah, this, this interface is very basic. It's very easy to get a very simple web application running. Um, and it's very similar to Express. Uh, nice, but we should probably figure out how to scale it up, right? So when you have thousands or, or whatever, hundreds of routes, like you can't stuff it all in one file. So what makes sense is to choose sub-applications. Essentially, your file system is how you do your separation of concerns. So you create various little applications throughout your directory describing, like, oh, here's the file that's kind of responsible for these things. Um, and then the syntax changes a little. So now we introduce the idea of include to bring in sub-applications. Um, and this is how you scale up. This is how you have hundreds of routes doing various things. 
um, it works good. Um, each each uh, sub application has its own like uh, context in terms of uh, filtering and uh, uh, request filtering, but it also shares the same wrap namespace, so you can link between the uh, applications for the um, And child applications and augment how they're merged. So in this case, I provide some customization options specifying uh, what I call path and name. Uh, so there's something interesting going on here. Uh, the name is essentially prepended to all the names of the wraps. So here we have one that's called profile that matches this URL. So now this wrap name is actually user.profile. Um, and if you know how uh, Lua modules work, what does dot mean? Directory separator. Yes, so why is that interesting? Well, um, our view file like hierarchy now matches our application. Um, so the thing Lapis really tries to push is everything should have an obvious way of mapping to a Lua module name. Um, the package.path is king, right? This is how you bring in anything. So whether it's views, helpers, applications, et cetera, et cetera, you're always interacting with the package.path. Um, yeah, so let's talk about routing. Uh, so not many of you have made websites, so hopefully this makes some sense. But like when you go to a website, there's a path at the end, right? So maybe that slash is just like the home page, and here is slash page slash this thing, which means like uh, any any text that can match a variable of the page, right? And this one says post slash an ID and a post name. This one says browse and then a bunch of other junk. This one uses parentheses to say, oh, these parts are optional. And this one combines a bunch of other crap. And here we have like a, a, a clause that says it can only take uh, integers. Um, so cool. Uh, routing is a big part of web applications. Um, how do we scale this up? How do we make sure it's fast when we have a big application? Uh, the answer is pretty much null thing. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, null thing is awesome. Uh, essentially what I did is I wrote a parser for each of these. Um, so there's something very cool about null thing that the, the other null thing talked to really touch on is when you have this idea of captures, it can return any Lua value. So what happens if you, the thing you return from your capture, right? Let's say I match a part of, part of the string and I return something wrong. What if it's another LPEG grammar? So essentially, this is written as an LPEG grammar that generates an LPEG grammar. And what you get in the end is just a bunch of grammars that you can it all together, matches all your reps. That's how routing works. Pretty cool. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, additionally, there's a, this routes are two-way contract, so if I want to generate a URL to a certain page, I have to pass in the data to turn it to the URL, so more grammar, so. Um, but yeah, all works great, uh, a lot of routes, it's fast, it's good. Um, views uh, are this idea of, oh, we want to render HTML when someone hits our server. Uh, Lapis provides two ways to views. Um, on the left, we have an embedded Lua kind of template thing, um, which is pretty nice. It actually transpiles transparently to Lua code and rewrites error messages, so it kind of feels like it's just a Lua file that happens to have some like strings mixed in. Um, it's pretty fast. And on the right, we have this uh, MoonScript style syntax that uses uh, essentially meta table uh, global variable lookups to, to automatically generate DSL for HTML. I also like that a lot. Um, so these two things have something in common, though. Um, and this has to do with the module load path. Um, when we reference a view, we just uh, reference its module path, uh, a.b.c, whatever, right? Um, and so each of these views should have the same interface to render when you say require them. Um, and so a library I wrote a while ago, something called loadkit, allows you to load arbitrary files from the load package path. Uh, so this is actually a, a really cool idea. Um, imagine you're running a transpile programming language and you want to just say require hello.world and it knows how to load a moon file and run it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, it's, it's a way of just enhancing the package path to load whatever you want. Um, Imagine you're running an extension module, and now you want to like bundle in views, which happen to be in a mustache or some other weird format. Uh, yeah, augment the package path, and now you have like a uniform way to load them. Uh, this is really useful, very cool. Um, models is this idea of completely separate idea. I'm sorry, I'm going through quickly. Uh, models is an idea of mapping database tables to things in memory in your application. Um, an instance of a model is essentially a row in a relational database. Uh, hopefully you've heard of these concepts before. Uh, Lapis gives you a rich suite of functions for finding, updating, deleting, whatever else you do. Nothing out of the ordinary here. Um, but how they're loaded is kind of interesting. Uh, so if you uh, notice before we created a new project, we were given this uh, models.blue file. And this is what it looks like. Uh, this is the autoloader, essentially. Um, so what is autoload? Well, it lets you do something like this. Uh, we can bring in this models module, and now we can reference 
classes by name, and it'll automatically translate them to uh, the equivalent required. Um, this is a nice thing. Uh, I hate using globals. I'm like super anti-globals. This is kind of a way of encapsulating a set of globals to a certain namespace in the package path. I think this is much better. Um, in WinScript, you might write something like this. Uh, the reason why I like this better is because it's more friendly for static analysis and linting. Uh, you can make sure that you're not referencing things that don't actually exist. Uh, <clears throat> Um, and so models are nice, uh, but when you have a lot of them, how do you keep track of what's in them? Uh, Lapis doesn't really force this. You don't have to write the schema of the model in the class. Um, so here's a cool little thing I wrote. Uh, essentially, given this model, it scans the database and dumps a big comment on top. Uh, it shows you the schema. Highly recommended. Um, it makes development so much easier. I don't have to look at the, the database anymore. I can still open up the file and there's all the information I need. Uh, cool little trick. Um, Environment-based configuration, so another concept. Uh, it's easy to take for granted, but it's actually really powerful. So the code you run in your production environment is rarely configured the same way as your development environment, right? Um, and as you provision more servers to scale up horizontally, you need to make sure they're running with the right options. Um, Environment-based configuration is just a way of saying, hey, we're in this environment, these are all these values are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it allows you some arbitrary key values, it provides a nice DSL for doing it, it's good. Um, and all you need to do is create a file called config.loop. Um, if you have any secrets, you can do it in a separate file. It's easy to merge them. Don't check your secrets into your repository. <coughs> uh, testing. Uh, so Busted is my tested, testing framework of choice. Highly recommended. Um, if you're using a, any sort of framework that doesn't give you a method to write tests against it, then you should uh, kind of reconsider your choices. Um, one of the things I've realized is building on a big application is if you're not testing, then you're just screwing yourself over for the future. Um, you're really going to regret it. Um, a lot of the features that I develop these days are very test driven. I'm writing tests at the same time as I develop it. Um, so yeah, uh, Lapis provides integration on a couple different levels for testing. Um, but I want to talk about one of the more interesting ones. Well, the, the boring one is that it lets you stub out an entire, entire request and response cycle in memory. But the interesting one is this thing called the test server. So remember now, Lapis runs inside of OpenRSD, which is Nginx. So when you actually do run it, you're running an Nginx process. Busted, on the other hand, runs in the command line. Um, so this test server is this idea of uh, Busted will, will spawn, or not Busted, uh, the, the, the test runner will spawn a, like a hijacked version of your Nginx config in a special mode that lets the tests communicate with it. So that means that when you say, in my test, uh, it should load slash, let me request slash. It's actually doing a real HTTP request with Lua Socket. Uh, so you're probably thinking uh, this is kind of crazy. Um, it is a little crazy. It has to use some RPC stuff to kind of communicate between um, like errors and stuff and things like that. But it's also really cool. Why? Because it's a true integration test. Um, you can verify your little code, you can verify your Nginx configuration all in one go. Uh, it, surprisingly, it's really uh, quite fast. <laughs> Um, I tend to use this on most of the tests I write in my suite. I'm well over 2,000, and like it runs in under a minute. Um, the slowest things are really a, a clearing out database tables. Um, and it lets you do other really cool things uh, like this. So I'm releasing a bunch of code as part of this talk that I've kind of been holding on to for a while. I've been meaning to make modules. Uh, Lapis spec screenshot provides, it provides an output handler um, that you can use to uh, take a screenshot of what's being rendered. Um, there's a tool called WK HTML to image that essentially just, uh, you go to URL and spits back a pin. So what if we just made a, something that just, whenever the test got a 200 uh, HTML page, 200 status code, just turn it to a pin. Um, this is really awesome. <laughs> this is one of the things I was like, yeah, this is, this is really cool. Um, uh, essentially now I have a way to uh, visual regression testing on my entire suite with a couple lines added, right? So here's actually a dump of the, the itch.io test suite, all the images, I kind of uh, combine them into a little collage. Um, yeah, so me personally, I kind of just look through them to look for visual regressions, but there's definitely opportunities to do some uh, automated analysis to see if things are changing and breaking. Um, very cool stuff. Um, doesn't stop there with this, this idea of the test server. Uh, Fandom.js is a, how much time? Okay, okay. Fandom.js is a, a headless browser. Um, which means that you can control the browser from the command line tool, uh, from the command line. Uh, so why is this cool? Well, you have an actual HTTP server running, so you just point it out there, and you can run your tests for JavaScript. Uh, very cool. Uh, I have a module for this, but it's not added, so you'll have to go to it. Um, a 
exception tracking. Uh, this is important. Uh, your code is going to break, like this library apparently. Ignore that build failing on there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, exceptions are uncaught errors, right? You need a way to record them. And so this is a system to just save them into the database so you can look over them later to see what's going on. Um, it sends me an email or it sends my team an email when something's breaking so we can look at it. It bugs us on Slack. This is critical. If you're running a web application, you need something like this. Um, you need to be aware of things are breaking. Uh, lack of stats is another new module I'm releasing. Um, collecting metrics is, is very important. Um, to, for keeping things going smooth. Uh, StatsD is a protocol that's pretty common, and InfluxDB is a time series database. So combine all these things into a library and you get graphs. So here now I can track request volume, query volume, break things apart by percentile. This type of visibility is critical for running a web application, especially if you have people using it, because if something's breaking or you've deployed some bad code, you want to know as fast as possible. Um, and there's a lot more. Uh, I've released a lot of libraries for doing a lot of cool things in Lapis. Um, the reason why I'm going to show all those is that there's a lot of stuff you can do. Um, the suite is good. Um, it's ready for web development. Uh, if you're better at learning by uh, like looking at code or some open source Lapis projects, uh, you may have used BlueRocks.org before. That's made Lapis. Um, and yeah, so Google Web Development is the real deal. Uh, make a big website in it. That's it. Yes. Uh, so I'm assuming for your model handling, you've got some sort of classes that uh, wrap around the drivers, you know, RSQ like MySQL or PDSQL, things like that. Correct. Uh, given that the Lua RSQ MySQL driver doesn't have prepared statement capability, mm -hmm. how are you handling standardization in these frameworks? Okay, so I actually use Postgres. I don't. I can't recommend MySQL to anyone. Sure. <laughs> uh, I wrote the Postgres driver that most open RSQ people use. It's called PGMoon. Um, well, we have a standardization function. Yeah, it's it's an actual legitimate concern. It should be avoided by a SQL injection, and it works. So. Uh, any other questions? It does use different things. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, so it's just a bunch of Lua running in Nginx, so whatever Nginx can do, you can also just have happen. Um, so yeah, all my sites use HTTPS. Yeah? So when are you getting it to run on Lua HTTP? Uh, can you repeat that? When are you getting it to run on Lua HTTP? Uh, I heard something about that. Yeah, someone will tell you to ask that question. He asked, when am I getting it to run on Lua HTTP? Soon. Right now it only runs on uh, OpenResty, but I want to explore different uh, servers as backups. Any questions? Yeah, let me do. So I'm just curious, there's some other frameworks I've read about, like Seder. Uh huh. Um, I can only recommend this. I don't know. I, I, have, I don't have a lot of experience with the other frameworks that have come out in the past few years because I've been really like heads down for this. Um, but I'll be glad to talk about it like later after the talk. I think that would warrant a longer answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, you did mention that you run your uh, test suite using Phantom JS. Uh huh. Why the choice of Phantom JS and not using something like uh, entirely Chrome or Firefox projected onto a virtual display? Because uh, it's annoying to set up. I think in general, like most web developers these days are using PandaJS. I know there's a couple other solutions, but it's, it's definitely the easiest. Yeah. No, because I also do end-to-end tests, and all I do is take the I use Selenium and I just connect it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard of people doing that. Yeah. And I just project it on over to the uh -huh. I, I like PandaJS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I just want to ask you because uh, you know. Uh, trend is to move to prototype or uh, object oriented. And uh, I saw that in Moonscript you use uh, something like class, like for sugar code. Uh, uh, do you have any plans to change that or you follow this uh, like uh, normal inheritance uh, for or object oriented program? I, well, I kind of missed the question. You, like you're asking about Moonscript's object oriented programming? Yeah, yeah if you if you plan to change it to, more, to be more object, uh, prototype oriented programming? Oh, uh, so well, the Moonstrips class system is implemented using prototypical inheritance, right? Oh. It's just sugar on top of what Google already does, essentially. But yeah. the only thing that can, uh, people can, can get the wrong mindset when programming is not better to give them the correct mindset from the beginning? 
I don't know if it's a matter of correct or not correct, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I, I happen to really like this organization because it kind of forced you to think about things in a certain way, but it's still very flexible for this loop, right? So if you want to do something crazy, you can just drop down and change what's going on. Um, have you thought of uh, trying to have the dynamic event that you Yeah, the question was asked about Moonshine, which I think is an outdated JavaScript implementation of Blue. Um, yeah, I think that's a cool idea. It's something I haven't had time to explore with yet. I think there's a, like the new maintainers, there's a new project, but yeah. It's that one. It's all right. Yeah, yeah, that's what it's doing. Okay, thank you.